Hello, and welcome to an exciting study of Hebrews, one of the 21 letters in the New Testament. This letter was originally written to Hebrew or Jewish Christians who were struggling with their faith. Have you ever struggled with your Christian faith? These readers had grown up under Judaism, the old law, but they had learned about Christ. They were baptized. They were members of his church. They were making their Christian journey, but they found the Christian walk a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. There was persecution going on in the Roman Empire, and some of these believers became afraid and weary and discouraged and were considering quitting the Christian race and going back to their comfortable old faith. Have you ever considered quitting your Christian walk and returning to a comfortable old faith or no religion at all? This letter was inspired by God to encourage and strengthen Christians who are struggling with their faith. It encouraged those in the first century to keep on keeping on, to persevere all the way to the end even if that end meant death for their faith. And it encourages Christians today to persevere all the way to the end. Christians do become weary and discouraged because persecution still exists today in mild or severe forms. Perhaps your co-workers or friends or family don't understand your beliefs and convictions. They don't understand why you don't go out with them on Sunday because you want to go to worship and you don't drink with them, and you don't participate in their little white lies, and they have to modify their language when they're around you. Perhaps you felt teased or mocked or even shunned for your faith. And in some regions of the world, Christians are treated even more harshly. They are arrested and killed for their, their faith. And that's what was going on in the first century when the Hebrews letter was written. Because these Hebrew Christians have become weary and discouraged, and some were tempted to quit Christianity and go back to Judaism. I found a nice comparison of this concept in a, a movie, Love Comes Softly, one of my favorites. It's about a pioneer woman named Marty, and she was traveling northwest with her husband to find a new home. They were seeking a better place to live. But obstacles and disappointments got in the way. It made their journey wearisome and long. And Marty lost sight of the purpose of her trip. But happily, as the story unfolds, <clears throat> Marty re regained her perspective of this journey. She accepted encouragement from other people. And she kept on keeping on to the end of her journey and ended up in a better place which was her goal. And I use this comparison in the introduction of our study guide for these series, Journey to a Better Place, a women's guided study of Hebrews. It was published in 2017 by Gospel Advocate, and it contains many more details and insights than we could possibly cover in our study. So I want to encourage you, if you like, to get Journey to a Better Place. <coughs> and to read it for your personal study, but also to follow along in our lessons. I will be referring to it uh, often in our study. And I want to begin with the first page, uh, Roman numeral nine, after giving the story of Marty and her journey to a better place. The study guide says, a similar narrative is beautifully expressed in the book of Hebrews. When we begin the Christian life, we set out on a journey to a better place. We will face obstacles and disappointments. We will be tempted to turn back to comfortable old ways, but the encouragement of our brothers and sisters and a focus on heaven will help us remain on the trail and achieve our dream of heaven. And I like that last sentence. We need to stay close to our Christian brothers and sisters and keep our focus on heaven, and that will help us to persevere and to remain on the trail of our journey to a better place. The introduction then suggests that if we lived during the pioneer days of Marty and we wanted to encourage her, what would we do? We can't text her, we can't email her, there are no cell phones during the pioneer days. We would have to write a letter of encouragement. And the study guide states at the top of Roman numeral page 10, Hebrews is such a letter. 
It was written to first century Hebrew Christians who were struggling, discouraged, and considering going back to their old Jewish faith. They needed reminding that Judaism cannot save. Only Christianity can get them and us to the better place. It's important to understand that these early believers did start out strong. Their faith was strong when they were first converted. Do you remember when you were baptized? When you wanted to follow Christ and your faith was strong and your journey started out uh, with, with strength. But over time, things can change. I want to read something that the Hebrews writer wrote to remind those first century Christians of how they felt in their former days when they first were converted. In Hebrews 10, 32 to 34, it gives an explanation of how they started out. I'll begin reading with the easy to read version and then I'm going to switch over to the New King James. In Hebrews 10, 32 to 34, it says, Remember the days when you first learned the truth? You had a hard struggle with much suffering, but you continued strong. Sometimes people said hateful things to you and mistreated you in public, and sometimes you helped others who were being treated the same way. Yes, you helped them in prison and shared in their suffering, and you were still happy when everything you owned was taken away from you. You continued to be happy because you knew that you had something much better, something that would continue forever. And that last verse in the New King James says, for you had compassion on me and my chains, the author, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. And the study guide encourages or continues on page 10. They felt confident in their journey to a better place. And then it explains what had happened to them. This is on Roman numeral page 10. Over time, their strength had waned. Christian mentors had died, and those left behind began to drift away from the faith. They neglected study of God's word and regular worship and failed to grow spiritually. Without maturity producing scripture and encouragement from Christian brothers and sisters, they became weary and discouraged. Hebrews 12, 3 says they became weary and discouraged. And Hebrews 13, 9 says they became vulnerable to various and strange doctrines. And then I love the description in Hebrews 12, 12. It says, spiritually, they suffered from hands which hang down and feeble knees. Can you just see someone weak and weary with their hands hanging down and their knees feeble? And he's, uh, Hebrews writer describes them spiritually in this way. And then it says they were unprepared to face the mounting persecution. And in chapter 3.12, it says they were in danger of leaving Christianity. Many were tempted to turn back to their comfortable old Jewish faith. The letter of Hebrews was written to encourage these Jewish converts to keep on keeping on in their Christian walk. Sometimes Christians just need a reminder that the Christian way is better. In fact, you may have heard preachers or commentaries say that the theme of Hebrews is better. Christianity is better than their former religion of Judaism. Jesus is better than their former Jewish leaders, Abraham and Moses and Isaac and Jacob and Aaron. Jesus' sacrifice is better than the sacrifice of blood and goats in the Old Testament system because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the writer explained to readers that to reject Christianity and to turn back to Judaism was spiritual suicide. It's the same today. If we leave the Christian faith and turn back to a comfortable old way, it's spiritual suicide. When I was growing up, my mom made us memorize scriptures, and one of them was Acts 4.12, which says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among men given whereby we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus can save us. So the Hebrews letter offers encouragement to, keep, to help us keep on keeping on in the Christian walk and to persevere all the way to the end, even if that end means dying for our faith. So let's begin our study with an introduction to the letter of Hebrews. To understand any book of the Bible, we must ask three questions. Who wrote the book? 
To whom was it written? And why was it written? What's the purpose of the letter? Why was Hebrews written? Let's begin with who wrote the book of Hebrews. Well, we do not know for sure. Some say that it was Paul because the thoughts in the letter of Hebrews are so much like the thoughts in the other letters. And Paul is the most prolific writer of letters in the New Testament. He wrote, for sure, 13 of the 21 letters. He wrote Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and Philemon. We know he wrote these because he reveals himself as the author in every one of these. Let's look at a few. First, we'll turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Then down in verse 7, it says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So he is saying, I, Paul, am writing this letter to Christians, saints in Rome. Then we turn to Galatians chapter 1 and we read the first two verses. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So he says, I, Paul, am writing this letter to the Christians who live in Galatia. And one more. We look at Philemon verses 1 one and two. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Athea, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your home. So Paul says he is writing to Philemon and those with him. In each of these 13 letters, Paul says he is the author. But the letter to the Hebrews has no such claim Nowhere in this letter do we find the name of its author. And so some suggest that it was someone else, such as Luke or Apollos or Clement of Rome or someone else. And here are three reasons that they give. One, they say if Paul had written it, why did he not say so, as he did in the other letters? Second, though the thoughts sound like Paul's, the style and composition of the letter are not like his other letters. And third, the Hebrews letter, of course, is written in Greek, and my new open study Bible says in an in, in introductory material, the Greek style of Hebrews is far more polished and refined than found in any of Paul's recognized epistles. And also, Paul knew the Hebrew language, so we might assume that he would quote from the Hebrew Old Testament and all the Old Testament references given in Hebrews. But the writer of Hebrews quoted from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I'm not saying Paul didn't write the letter to the Hebrews. We do not know who the author is. However, there is an explanation given by some commentaries that makes some sense. They suggest that the material in the letter to the Hebrews may be a sermon. Hebrews calls itself a word of exhortation in 1322. James Thompson in his Hebrew commentary suggests that the style and the method of argument in the letter are like a sermon in the ancient synagogue. And he notes that the ending in Hebrews 11.22 could be a salutation from a person who wrote down the sermon, perhaps one of Paul's sermons, and sent it to friends. Perhaps the writer took notes or copied a sermon perhaps one of Paul's sermons, and sent it to struggling Jewish converts. Have you ever heard a sermon and you took the notes or asked for a CD and sent it to friends that you thought really needed this message? Well, the message of Hebrews is certainly a message that the Hebrew Christians needed. And that is a plausible explanation. And the original title of this letter in the Greek was Pros Hebraeus which is to Hebrews. So it's a great title for a letter that could have been circulated among weak and struggling Jewish Christians during a time of persecution in the Roman Empire. So who wrote Hebrews? Well, we don't know for sure. Uh, a third century church father named Origen said, only God knows the truth. 
And it's not vital that we know who wrote it. It's vital that we know why it was written, and that was to help struggling Christians with their faith. And it helps Christians today to strengthen our faith. To whom was the letter of Hebrews written? This second question, well, we know it was written to Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians, and some suggest it might have been a specific congregation, such as the church in Rome or the church in Jerusalem, but we don't know that for sure. But we do know it was an excellent letter written to encourage any weak and struggling Jewish Christian, or even any struggling Christian, but those living in the first century specifically. I'm going to pause for a minute and look at the word Hebrew. And let's talk about it. It first appears in Scripture in Genesis 14, 13, referring to Abram the Hebrew. This was before God changed Abram's name to Abraham. But he was called the Hebrew. And I found a website of Messianic Jews, oneforchrist.org, which asserts that the root of the original term Hebrew means to cross over or to pass through. To cross over or to pass through. And that's interesting. According to the website, Abraham was called an Ivri, the word Hebrew, one that has crossed, quote, referring to the fact that he came from the other side of the river. He and his family had traveled from close to the river Euphrates, crossed over into Haran, and then God called him back over the river again to the land which we now know to be Israel. And the association between these Hebrews and the crossing of rivers appears a few times in the Bible. I want to show you this is true. I'm going to read some of the verses between uh, in Joshua 24, between verses 3 and 15, that make six references to Abraham and his descendants crossing over uh, a river or a sea. Verse 3. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And then he describes how he brought descendants into Egypt. Verse 6. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, the Red Sea, which they crossed. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen, and God saved them from the Egyptians there and took them... It says, to the wilderness for a long time. We know they were there 40 years. And verse 8 says, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And he talks about all the peoples that they conquered there, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites. But God says, I delivered them into your hand. And he did, and he gave them that land. And verse 14, this is Joshua talking now. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or on the gods or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's interesting that God's people in the Old Testament passed over across through water to do his will. And in the New Testament, his people passed through the waters of baptism in order to do his will. So I thought this little bit of Old Testament history and, and reminiscent of some of the Old Testament events would uh, interest you. And you will find many, many references to Old Testament concepts, people, and events in the letter to the Hebrews. If you're familiar with such events, such as Abraham taking his son up on Mount Moriah and the children of Israel crossing over the Red Sea, all of these events, if you're familiar with them, you're going to find this rather difficult letter to the Hebrews much more easily understandable. If you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you will learn much, you will grow, you will see concepts of people and events in the Old Testament and how they are shadows of what God planned for the New Testament. And you will see how the Old Testament ties together with the New Testament as God brings his plan of salvation into being. 
So this study of Hebrews will strengthen your faith. And if you're weary and discouraged and tempted to quit Christianity, it'll help you see that it is spiritual suicide because Christianity is better. So now, we've looked at the origin of the term Hebrew in the Old Testament. So what does it mean in the New Testament when we get to the Hebrews letter? Well, the pulpit commentary says in the New Testament, this term refers to people who use the Hebrew language in public worship and kept Hebrew customs and traditions. These were the recipients of this Hebrews letter in the first century. They had converted to Christianity. They had come out of Judaism. They still practiced uh, the Hebrew language and traditions, but they were following Christ. And that's all we know about these recipients. We don't know exactly where they lived, but we do know the time that they lived. This letter was probably written in the mid to late 60s AD. My New Open Study Bible says between 64 and 68 AD during Christian persecution under Roman Emperor Nero. And I researched a little bit of history in our brother Everett Ferguson's book, Backgrounds of Early Christianity. He shares that when Christianity was first established, those in the Roman government associated it with the legally protected religion of Judaism. The Roman government thought, well, it's just a branch of Judaism, so it was legally protected. But Ferguson wrote, it was during Nero's reign that the Jews succeeded in convincing the Roman authorities that Christians were a distinct group that needed to be treated differently. So there was a great fire in AD 64 in the Roman Empire and Nero blamed Christians. And soon after that we find the first recorded official persecution of Christians by the empire. And Ferguson noticed that, that noted that Christians were charged with the arson because they claimed the world would be destroyed by fire. That's some of the things that were said about them. Was this why those Christians were discouraged? It would certainly discourage us. So I found a great paragraph that explains the state of affairs of these Jewish Christians during this time the letter was written. I found it in a commentary by R.N.C. Linsky. I really like Linsky's commentaries of the New Testament. He, like many other scholars, they, they know the language, the history, the culture, and looking at commentaries by such men as we study the Bible help us to understand better. So I'm going to read this paragraph from R.N.C. Linsky. It is in the study guide. It says, In this body of Jewish Christians, a movement is underway to give up Christianity and go back to their former Judaism. This movement has yet not gained much momentum. No members have actually apostatized. The leaders still stand firm. This body of Jewish Christians has suffered some persecution for sympathizing with brethren who are of their own body, but were imprisoned. And we read that in Hebrews 10, 32 to 34. Yet none of the readers were themselves imprisoned at this time, and none of them had lost their lives by martyrdom. Hebrews 12, 4 explains this. They had not yet resisted to bloodshed. Linsky goes on, This entire body of Jewish Christians had remained true during the trying times of the past, but something had now occurred which led a number of them to think it would be of great advantage to them to go back to their old Judaism. It is this incipient defection which calls forth this letter. And scholars say that this letter was written before AD 70. So between 64 AD and 68, what happened in AD 70? That was the destruction of Jerusalem and the flattening of the temple. But we know Hebrews was written before that happened. The letter doesn't say anything about the destruction of Jerusalem, but it does say in Hebrews 8, 4, and 10, 11, the priests were still ministering daily in the temple. And Martel Pace, in his Truth for Today commentary, says... This letter certainly would prepare the Jewish Christians for the upcoming loss of the temple and, quote, all that it represented. All that was in the Old Testament Jewish system and its rituals were temporary. They were ineffective for forgiveness of sins. He urged them, don't go back into Judaism, but persevere in the saving Christian faith. 
Now our third question, what was the purpose of the letter to the Hebrews? I think we know now. And the study guide summarizes it in Roman numeral page 13. It summarizes, readers needed reminding that Christianity is better than the Jewish religion they left. The law of Moses had served its purpose. It was a tutor to bring people to Christ, Galatians 3.24. And it was a shadow of good things to come, Hebrews 10.1. Its animal sacrifices were never able to wash away sin. They were merely symbolic of the true sacrifice, Jesus and his saving blood. When he died, his new will and testament came into effect. A new covenant was established through his church. God's plan of salvation was complete. Therefore, the old Jewish system was no longer necessary. So this was the purpose of the letter, to remind them that Christianity is better than Judaism. It encouraged them to keep on keeping on all the way to the end, and it helps us to keep on keeping on to persevere. Because our goal in the Christian race, just like Marty's goal in Love Comes Softly, is to get to a better place, a better place, heaven. So we've been introduced to the Hebrews letter. We know it was written to weary and discouraged Jewish Christians who were struggling with their faith. They were tempted to quit the Christian race and go back to their comfortable old ways. And this letter of encouragement still helps weary Christians today. So perhaps you are weary and you are tempted to leave Christianity. Think about why. What are the circumstances? What are the reasons? It can happen to anyone. So the, I have a paragraph at the end of the introduction here that explains what can happen in our world today and what is happening that discourages many Christians uh, and uh, leaves them perhaps wanting to quit. It says drifting and temptation to leave the faith can occur when one loses sight of the better place. Neglecting Bible study and fellowship can lead to apathy. Secular activities and peer pressure can distract us. An entire group can grow weary and spend Sundays going through the motions. Some have left the church after years of assembling with lethargic congregants, dutifully enduring shallow studies of the word, and wondering why neighbors are not attracted to their Christian religion. The Hebrews letter is a wake-up call. And that is true. So now let's dive in to the first chapter of this wake-up call. In the short time we have left in this lesson, we're going to look at chapter 1, the first three verses. I've entitled the study of this first chapter of Hebrews in the first chapter of the study guide, Follow God's Son. Because the Hebrews opens up with the reminder to follow God's son, not leaders in the old Jewish religion. There's a strong reminder that Jesus is better. His covenant is better. His promises are better. His reward at the end of our life is better than anything any other religion can offer. So let's read the opening paragraph of the study guide on page one. Discouraged. This describes some first century Jewish Christians. The Christian walk was not as easy as they had hoped. They believed in God and knew his word, but they needed reminding of his more recent communication through Jesus. To end doubts about their new faith, the Hebrews writer began his letter with the powerful opening statement of Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three. So let's read and examine the first verse and a half of Hebrews chapter 1, and then we'll look at the second one and a half verses. You know, the letter to the Hebrews was not divided into chapters and verses. None of the books of the Bible were. This is a, a man's tradition. So it was, this was a letter. And let's see how he starts out in the first verse and a half. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Let's stop there. Throughout human history, God has communicated with humans in various times and different ways, right? At first, he spoke to the father, the husband, the head of each household. We know that in Genesis 2.16, he spoke to Adam and told him not to eat the forbidden fruit. 
Now, we know God also rebuked Eve in Genesis 3 when he rebuked them both for their sin. But in general, God communicated with the male head, the father of each family. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And another term for father, through whom God communicated here, is patriarch. So scholars call this first period of time when God spoke to the fathers as the patriarchal age. And I have a chart here I want to share with you which shows the patriarchal age is one of three ages that show that God communicated in various times in different ways. And the first time and way was the patriarchal age beginning with Adam. It lasted about 2,500 years when God spoke to the fathers. This chart was prepared by Donnie Barnes. He was a minister. He passed away in 2013. And he made this and many more charts. These are available at BibleCharts.org or you can Google Donnie Barnes. But this patriarchal age lasted, like I said, about 2,500 years until the time of Moses when God communicated in a different way and that was through Moses, the lawgiver. He gave Moses the law for God's people and that lasted about 1,500 years. And God spoke through Moses and when he died, the prophets, until the time of Christ. So knowing that God communicated in various times and in different ways in time past helps us understand Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers and by the prophets, but when God's Son came to earth, that changed. A new and final period began. It was, it's called the Christian age, the last age, and it's the age in which we live. And in many times in the New Testament, this is referred to as the last days, but it began with Christ. The Christian age began when God communicated his new covenant through his son. So verse 2 begins, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Jesus spoke to us while he was on the earth, and he left a new message that's revealed in the New Testament. It's a complete, it's a final revelation message, according to Jude 3. It's a better message. It was given through a better spokesman, God's Son. So Jesus fulfilled that old law of Moses, and Colossians 2.14 says he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So in these last days, God's people do not follow Moses and the prophets. We follow God's Son. And it's beautifully illustrated in the account of Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17 and in Mark 9. I'm going to read the Matthew 17, 1 through 8 account of Jesus on the Mount Transfigur of Transfiguration. And listen to how beautifully it explains that God no longer wants his people to follow Moses and the prophets, but to hear his son. Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The study guide on page one summarizes. The temporary law of Moses had ended. Christ's New Testament ushered in the Christian age. This concept was beautifully pictured in Mark 9, 2 through 8, and as we read in Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John onto the Mount of Transfiguration. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared next to him. 
As Peter suggested that the men worship all three, God took away the lawgiver and the prophet and proclaimed of Jesus, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hebrews exalts God's son as the author and finisher of our faith in Hebrews 12, 2. He is the only way to the better place, John 14, 6. Another one of those scriptures Mom made us learn. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Those opening verses of Hebrews chapter 1 take the attention of the readers away from the Jewish faith and points to the only one who can offer them eternal life, and that's God's Son. So now in the few minutes we have left, we'll look at the second one and a half verses, the rest of verse 2 and verse 3. Here the writer exalts God's Son. He's not yet called him by his name Jesus, nor referred to him as the Messiah or the Christ. He is here emphasizing his deity, which none of those in the Old Testament had. Those leaders were not God. This is God's Son. So the, the uh, writer of Hebrews describes God's Son in six ways. I'm going to read Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, so it'll all tie together and flow from God's communication through his son into the description of God's son in six ways. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers and by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And the study guide will go into these six descriptions a little bit uh, in more detail, but I'll read the summary on page three. The Son of God is creator, sustainer, redeemer, and exalted one at God's right hand. Jewish readers who believed and obeyed the Lord in baptism needed to realize his superiority. Why should they have considered going back to an old system that ended at his cross, Colossians 2.14? Jesus, with everything he offers, is better. So we see he, the Hebrews writer opens his letter exalting Christ, who brought God's final word and plan of salvation. In our next lesson, we'll look at the rest of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 14. And these bring a very important message to the Hebrews readers because it says, number one, God's son is better than the angels, and number two, he is the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And these Hebrew Christians knew their Old Testament, and they knew those Old Testament prophecies. So this letter strengthens faith that God's son is who we should follow today. And this faith is essential for Christians to keep on keeping on in the Christian faith and to persevere all the way to the end, even if that end means death, to the better place. So I'll ask these reflection questions. If you're by yourself, think about the answers, and if you're with a group, you can discuss them. Number one, have you become weary and discouraged in your faith? Have you considered leaving the Christian race and going back to a comfortable old faith or no religion at all? Think about the reasons and know that this study will encourage and strengthen that faith. And number two, why do you think the Hebrews writer exalted Christ in these first opening verses of Hebrews chapter one? I hope that this study today has whetted your appetite for future study in the book of Hebrews. Thank you.